going to be happening this year. There's going to be a, a mighty outpouring of God upon the people. And let's keep praying for our, our lost and unsaved loved ones and our friends and our neighbors, people that we work with. Let's just lift them up this morning.
Thank you, O Lord. Amen. And now, I do need a volunteer to read our scripture this morning or this afternoon. Proverbs six. It's only a few verses. Carol, please come up. wicked man. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, and a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. Thank you, Carol. So before we come into our new year and new sermon series, um, here's a message I'd actually rather not do, but which must be done. It's just kind of a one-off. You know, this isn't part of any series, just sort of a, a solo message. And it's a bit different than my usual style because this is actually a topical sermon, right? I don't usually do that. We're going to be looking at just one sin in particular. And you can probably guess what that sin is. Slander. Right? It's not, not a surprise. So what is slander? I want to just start with a definition. That's the first slide. So san- slander is when you say negative words about someone else that you cannot prove. Okay? So you might not be able to prove them for three reasons. Maybe they're made up. You just made something up about somebody. Now you won't be able to prove that, right? Because it's a lie. Maybe it was just based on hearsay. You heard someone say, hey, oh, so-and-so did this, but you didn't actually check the fact yourself, and then you spread that information. That is hearsay. You still cannot prove it, so you might as well be lying. And the third thing is when you just assume something. So, for example, people do this with motives. Like, oh, this person did that, and they did it because of this reason. Well, you're not in their head, and you can't actually know what their motives are. So because you cannot know it, you might as well be lying. That is slander. right? So these are the, the def- definitions we're going to be looking at. Uh, and this, this definition does just come from like English dictionaries and stuff. It's, uh, there's a lot of different words we're going to be looking at in Hebrew. It's more the topic, not necessarily a particular word. Now, there is a related sin. I just want to mention quickly gossip. Uh, that's on the next slide. Uh, so gossip, this is, somebody, this is true information, but you're speaking with somebody who is not part of the problem and not part of the solution. Okay. So that's, that's what gossip is. It might even be true. Maybe it's something that you did witness that you can prove, but you still don't need to be sharing it, right? So it's, it's, a related, it's a related sin, but we're not really focusing on gossip. But because a lot of these words overlap, I just did want to spend some time to just define the words. Let's start with our text in Proverbs. Six thing that, things that the Lord hates. That's a strong word. Right? Or some translations might put despises. Seven are an abomination to him. So haughty eyes or a proud look, as uh, Carol read it for us. Right? That is haughty eyes or when you're looking down your nose at somebody or something. So God hates your eyes when you are viewing yourself more highly than you ought. The second one, a lying tongue. Well, that's pretty obvious, right? God is truth, right? Jesus says, you will love the truth. The truth will set you free. So when your tongue is lying, God hates your tongue. That's what the text tells us. And when you are, if you are slandering, you are lying. If we go, uh, the next slide has the definition again, right? So the first one, that's obviously a lie. And the second one, well, if it's based on hearsay and you're just sharing that information, well, you don't know it's true, so you might as well be lying, right? Because you're just sharing something that may or may not be true. So you're, you're taking a chance with your tongue. And the third one, well, if you're just assuming something, once again, you cannot prove it, so you may as well be lying. Now, a question that comes up a lot of times with lies is, well, what if I believe it? What if I'm really sure it's true? Like, what if I say, well, I really believe that uh, Pierre Polyev is a pedophile. I really believe that. Am I allowed to go around sharing that information? Absolutely not. 
whether you believe it or not isn't actually what matters. It's whether you can prove it or not. And in fact, Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. Whether you believe it or not, you're going to be giving an account for those careless words. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. Right? So the proof matters. Now back to our uh, Proverbs The third thing on the list, hands that shed innocent blood, right? God hates violent hands. And yes, in a certain sense, no blood is innocent except for the blood of Jesus. But this is a comparative innocence, right, that God hates murder. It's in the Ten Commandments for a reason. The next two are pretty obvious uh, on the next uh, verse 18. A heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil. That's feet that enjoy evil. They see an opportunity for evil and they run towards it. Right, so it's pretty obvious th- these are sinful, evil things. God hates sin and evil. And then we come to uh, the final one. And notice in all these things, it's not a, it's not a person so far. Right? It was, it was the, the tongue, the eyes, uh, the heart, the feet. But then we come to the sixth. And this is what I'm focusing on today, the slander. And it's a false witness who breathes out lies. And who's a witness? It can be a person. right? And I know there's an expression, it's very popular among Christians, that oh, God hates sin, but he loves the sinner. And that is true, God does love even sinners. right? But God also hates sinners, as we can see in this passage. And I know that's a very popular thing that people say, but if I have a hundred people saying one thing and the Bible says something different, which am I going to believe? The Bible, right? And the Bible actually says that if you are a false witness, God hates you. Now, people are going to push back. Well, isn't God love? Doesn't God love the whole world? How can he do this? Well, God is perfectly able to love and hate. I can't do that. You know, I I can't hate without sinning, right? I I can't love in perfect measure like God can. But God can. So he can love you and hate you at the same time. At least that's what the the scriptures seem to indicate. So he hates a false witness who breathes out lies. Because slander is false witness. Because you are saying something that you did not witness as if you witnessed it. Right? That's what slander is. You're you're sharing something and you're, you're giving a false witness. And back to our definition. I think I have it one more time here. Uh, Yeah, there it is. Right? So if you made up or or you're lying about something, well, obviously you didn't witness it. If it's based on hearsay, you didn't witness it. If it's something that you're assuming about somebody's motives, you didn't witness their brain. Right? You don't know what's going on with their motives. So all those things, you are being a false witness. And the scriptures tell us that God hates that person. Now, this should not be too surprising. Think of the Ten Commandments. You sh- thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, your neighbor, right? That's, it's, it's there in the, in the Ten Commandments. It's up there in his list. Now, you might think, uh, this is just an Old Testament thing. I don't really need to be too concerned with it, right? Well, today we're going to look at what the New Testament says. And I want you to note here, I'm going to be flying through these scriptures, okay? I'm not going to be pausing so you can find, find the pages, but everything is on the back of the bulletin, okay? So if you don't have a bulletin, you can... Look it up after. And I encourage you to do this this week. Look through these scriptures day by day and, and see. Is what Adam is saying, is that actually what the scriptures say? Read them in context. You know, and, and then you can know whether I'm actually saying what the scriptures say or just my own opinion of the things. And I encourage you to do that all the time. But I put the scriptures on the back this week because I'm going through them very fast. Okay, first off, first question. What does slander accomplish? What does it do when you slander? Well, first, it defiles the person who does it. Matthew 15, 19 to 20. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. All right, so Jesus is dealing with some Pharisees who are saying, hey, why don't you wash your hands? And he says, no, it's not, the, it's not washing your hands that makes you dirty. It's not eating unclean foods that makes you unclean. It's what comes out of your mouth, what comes out of your heart that actually makes you unclean. So when you slander someone, you are making yourself dirty. You are making yourself unclean in the sight of God. But it also, it doesn't just ruin you. It also ruins the people who hear you. 
Proverbs 18.8 tells us, the words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels that go down into the inner parts of the body. So the slander you hear that is whispered in your ear, it goes into your heart, and then it fills your heart with that slander, and then what happens with it? Well, now it comes out. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth flows out, and then you become a slanderer as well. So it actually, it's like an infection that spreads. And this is why the Bible tells us not even to eat with Christians or professing Christians who slander. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 to 11. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of the world who are sexually immoral or the greedy or the swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, I'm going to define that word later, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. So what's Paul saying? Don't associate with immoral people, not meaning non-believers, all right? We expect non-believers to be engaging in adultery and idolatry and all these things, right? That's our mission field, okay? But if you call yourself a Christian, if you bear the name of brother or sister, but then you go on engaging in these activities, I'm not even supposed to eat with you. Why? Because it's going to make you unclean, and through coming into my ear and going down into my heart, it's going to make me unclean also. Now, um... The thing with a Christian who is an idolater, like, that's a contradiction in terms, right? Because who's a Christian? Well, someone who inherits the kingdom of God, someone who's been saved by Jesus, who professes the name of Jesus. So to say that that, that is why we don't associate with those people, because it's a contradiction. So 1 Corinthians 6, very next chapter, verse 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Right? So this group of people, the, the sexually immoral, the idolaters, all those, those people, this is the group of people where Christians come from. Right? Some of us were in those groups. But we were washed. We were sanctified. We were justified by Jesus Christ. And that, that is the difference. There's a, there's a transition. That's why Paul says, such were some of you. It's past tense. Right? That's the transformation, the being born again. is putting that stuff behind. That means in, for us, some of us, Sitting here were revilers, past tense. So what is a reviler? Let's define that word. That is when you damage someone with your words, okay? So it could mean I insult you to your face, you know? I say, oh, you're a cotton-headed ninny muggins, you know, and and then that really hurts your feelings, right? Uh, Or it could mean I'm, I'm saying something behind your back. And that's where we get into the slander. So you can see it's an overlapping meaning. It's not the same word, you're right, but it is an overlapping meaning. All these things, they overlap. And, um, and you might be wondering, like, are these words really overlapping? And, and there is one verse, 1 Peter 3.19, that just shows that slander and revile overlap. Uh, I think I have that on the next slide, perhaps. 1 Peter 3.19, or 3.16, yeah. There we go. Uh, Peter's giving them instruction. Have a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. You see, he's using the same thing. So these are Christians who were supposed to live righteous lives so that when people slander us, that they would be put to shame by reviling us. So the, the word is used kind of similar. Now let's go back to Romans 1. Actually, not really back. We haven't been there yet today. But maybe you were. Maybe you're reading Romans right now in your personal devotions. Romans 1, a whole list of things that are pretty awful. Paul's writing about sin entering the world, and he gives kind of a list of all the sins that come into the world through disobedience. Uh, Starting in verse 28. Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, 
God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. You see that list? Gossips, slanderers, haters of God. If you are slandering, you might as well be a hater of God. It's in the same level when Paul presents this sin, right? Because it's just listed just in order, right? Gossip, slanderers, haters of God. No variation here. These are all terrible things to be. Now, I, I do expect pushback here as well. Because people may say, oh, no, wait a minute. I can love God and I can still slander my fellow man. People might say that to me. Well, let's look what Jesus says. Uh, Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 43. And Jesus says, For no good tree bears bad fruit. Nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. People who slander are speaking out of the evil that is stored up in their heart. That's where it comes from. It's just flowing straight out of the heart. And maybe you're still not convinced. Maybe you still think, no, no, I I can love God and and slander people once in a while. Well, let's switch over to James' letter, chapter 3. You probably knew I was going here. Um, We're going to start in verse 9. With our tongue, we bless our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth... Come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives? Or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. So the way you speak about God is also how you should speak about others. Not saying that other people are omnipotent or immortal or anything, but, you know, we, we bless God. We should also bless others, right? You know, what does Jesus say is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord God with all your heart, right? Soul, strength, might, you know. And what is the second commandment? Love your neighbor as yourself, right? So the way we talk about God should also be the same way we treat his creation. People who are created in his image. And this is an absolute statement in scriptures, Okay, this is an absolute statement. I'm going to switch over to Jude. There's only one chapter in Jude. We're looking at uh, verse 9. When the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. The archangel Michael was not even willing to, to slander Satan himself the great deceiver, the father of lies, because Satan was also created by God. It is also God's creation, right? So if the archangel Michael is not willing to slander even the devil, why do we think we can go around slandering uh, uh, Justin Trudeau or Bill Gates? Where do you get that from? It's not from the scriptures. It comes from the culture, right? We live in a culture where slander is on every TV channel. On every YouTube stream, it seems. On Rumble, it's in the newspapers. People say it on the streets. It's just so casual. People say, oh, that's just part of being in a democracy. You have to slander people. Well, no, you don't. Right? Because our citizenship is not here in Canada. It is in heaven. And the people of heaven, the citizens of heaven, do not slander. We do not speak like that. And Now, by this point, you're probably wondering, well, why did Adam pick this topic of all the topics? And honestly, unfortunately, I think this is the most common sin in this congregation. It's not one person. It's multiple people. 
and I see it a lot. I see people posting slander on Facebook. People text me slander. People tell me right to my face, sometimes in this very room, slanderous things. Right? I hear it whispered in, in the corners. Some days I feel like I am drowning in slander, and I don't know what to do. So when I don't know what to do, I turn to the scriptures. And I came to Titus chapter 3. This is Paul's instructions to a young pastor. And he says to this young pastor who has a, you know, he has a congregation of his own, he says, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy to all people. Sorry, I got kind of cut off on the bottom there. So, yeah, Paul wrote this letter to a young pastor. Hey, I'm a young pastor, right? Remind them to speak evil of no one. It doesn't say speak evil of no one except Donald Trump, right? It doesn't say speak evil of no one except for Joe Biden. It doesn't, say, it doesn't even say speak evil of no one except Adolf Hitler, right? This is absolute speak evil of no one. There, there's no place for slander in our mouths. This, this is serious. This, so this is my reminder to you, this sermon, right? I'm, I'm just following these instructions. Remind them to do this. I'm here today reminding you to do this. So what do we do? If we're not going to be in camp slander, which camp are we going to be instead? Well, I'm going to look at a sister passage from the one I read this morning. This is Colossians chapter 3, 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And I know that's hard to read, but I didn't want to cut anything because I thought it was such, just so powerful. Every time we speak, right? Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, giving thanks, praising Lord. That's what, that's what Paul is saying. All our words should be the words of God, the words of Scripture we have. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Instead of filling your ears with slander, fill your ears with gospel, with the Bible, with godly words, words that build up and, and, and cheer up and, and stir up, right? Good, holy words. And as those get in your heart, then what's your mouth going to speak? It's going to speak from the abundance of your heart. So, Now, I, I came into this sermon. I didn't want to do it. It's, it's not fun. It's interesting reading the scriptures. I love, I love what I do, but it, it wasn't a fun topic to pick. Certainly not after the cheerfulness of Christmas. Here we get the, the bummer of this, this message. But I, I, I came into this, and I, every day as I was working on this, I, I read Paul's letter, 2 Corinthians. And this was the spirit that I come to this in. So uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8. He says, Even if I made you grieve with my letter... I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting, for you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. So Paul's basically saying, I'm sorry that I hurt you, but I'm not sorry. Because that grief that you feel, if it leads you to repentance, if you think, yes, I have fallen short in this area, that is a godly grief. And that is a good thing. That can only result in betterment. Right? We, we come and we, 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 we look at these passages, and I feel the weight of my sin. I, I certainly feel where I've fallen short in this. And I realize that how, how, fall, how far I am from God's perfect standard. Right? I, I recognize that my tongue has led me into, down the wrong path. My tongue has caused damage to, to other people. Maybe they know it, maybe they don't. Right? But my, my words have hurt people. And maybe this isn't a sin that, that bothers you. Maybe it's not really on your heart. And you're like, yeah, no, I, I got that under control. Well, I know for a lot of us, sometimes we see slander or we hear slander, and we just kind of let it go. 
and don't confront it. We do not acknowledge it. We do not defend the integrity of people whose reputations have been injured. We did not approach our brother or sister one-on-one, as the Bible tells us. Instead, we were quiet when we should have defended God's creation. So we will repent of that too. Because believe it or not, slander does not have the last word. The father of lies does not get the last word. Who gets the last word? Well, it is Jesus. He knew that the world was going to love slander, right? It's predicted, it's prophesied, right? He says in the last days, some will fall apart. Slanderers is in that list. You can go check it up. He knew that his followers would be tempted to slander. But he paid the price for those sins. Already, 2,000 years ago, he already paid the price for the slanders that we have uttered, for the, for the careless words that we have spoken. His blood has covered it. So now we're going to come as a church. We're going to repent. And rather than doing it silently, we're, we're going to do this together with our tongues. Right? We're going to use the tongues that got us in this mess in the first place. We're going to do a corporate prayer. I know it's not something we do very often. But this is in preparation for the Lord's Supper, right? Paul warns the Corinthians, do not take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, but rather, uh, <clears throat> uh, sorry, I lost the, lost the phrase, uh, rather examine yourselves, right? So th- th- this is part of our self-examination. We're going to come to a place of repentance. So please read along with me on the screen. Father, I confess that my tongue has slandered. I have been a false witness, a gossip, and a whisperer. When I have seen others do this, I did not defend the victim of these crimes. I am a person of unclean lips. I come from a people of unclean lips and unclean tongues. Today, I repent of my sins. I do not want to live that way. Instead, I want to do all things in a way that are pleasing to you. Now I come to you, Lord, to wash out my mouth with your body and your blood. Amen. Amen. And now I'll invite uh, our elders, Ernie and, and Fred, to take their spots. I'll invite the worship team up. And uh, Mark, could you shut the camera off if we're recording? We're going to come to the Lord's table together.